I'm going to be talking about some strategies um, that can be applied to any type of class. I'm really going to be focusing in on our laboratory classes um, that we taught in the spring. I'm going to talk about the one that I headed up with uh, Professor Matt Tresh, which is BME 207. Um, and this is an experimental design and measurement lab, and it replaces a class that was taught. Um, so 207 is a sophomore level class. It's replacing a junior level class uh, called 307 that has many of the same um, objectives. And so that course was taught for the final time in spring by uh, Professor O'Neill and Professor Rad. And so we'll see some results from both of these courses. So BME 207, that uh, experimental design and measurement lab for sophomores, taught things like sensor characterization and measurement uncertainty, um, hypothesis generation, experimental design, analysis with models. So you can imagine um, that with the movement move to online, there were lots of challenges that this presented. And so the techniques I'll show you, I think worked quite well. 307 covered a lot of the same uh, topics, but also one thing that we're going to talk about is the implementation of lab notebooks, um, which is something that we're going to continue in, in the future as a great reflective practice. So uh, we were tasked with teaching this virtual lab course, and we wanted to incorporate some of the evidence-based strategies that I had been using in my classroom for a long time. So I'm a big proponent of the flipped classroom and uh, guided inquiry lab. So I have taught uh, several labs in this style. I've also moved away from traditional assessment, and I use a standards-based grading assessment that's quite popular in K through 12 um, and is becoming more popular in higher education, but really not that commonplace. And then we've been using some reflective practices. So we incorporated all of these into this virtual lab course, and we wanted it to be hands on. Um, so we're going to talk about how we did that. First, let's dive into the flipped classroom. So the flipped classroom is a, a scenario where it, it's different from the traditional classroom where you are giving a lecture and uh, during the, the synchronous class time and then you go home, the students go home and they complete their homework assignments uh, many times uh, by themselves or in small groups. In the flipped classroom, now the lectures are online and the students come in and dedicate that class time to working in groups to solve problems. So. I adapted this, uh, I adopted this practice several years ago because it was a more student centered instruction uh, instructional practice which has been shown to be more effective than uh, teacher centered instruction and studies have shown that this is giving the, the students uh, or the instructors more um, the ability to deliver more content and the students are able to achieve similar or improved um, levels of comprehension. Um, also, the students feel that this is effective in terms of um, their performance and they have a positive attitude about it generally. I really was uh, motivated to adopt the flipped classroom when I was attending an, uh, an American Society of Engineering Education conference and so a presenter showed this uh, this slide here, it showed some electrodermal activity, um, which is really closely aligned with cognitive processing. And it showed it for a lot of different tasks, um, homework and sleeping. And very interestingly, you can see uh, what happens during class is pretty much flatlined. So while lecturing is really important, I wanted to create the opportunity for students to really uh, engage with the material. So. I implemented this in my in my classes at Arizona State, and I also incorporated other things like long term design projects uh, in class activities and a muddiest points exercise, which I'll spend a, um, a lot more time talking about at the end. I also incorporated the flip classroom and a big part of the flip classroom um, was were these pen casts and that's how I delivered my online uh, lectures. And students thought uh, that these practices were favorable, but if I had to rank them, they ranked the flipped classroom the least favorable. Um, but the fundamental component of these flipped classrooms, the pin cast, as the most favorable um, implement or strategy that I was using. So there could be a bit of a, an image problem with the flipped classroom, which has been seen in the literature. And so what you have to do is you have to 
give students evidence that the flipped classroom works um, so that they can buy into it. So once I started to do that, I saw much more um, acceptance of the flipped classroom. And as students got used to it and they are seeing it in more classes, um, there's a lot more buy-in. So how does the flip classroom work in our lab classes? So this was both for the sophomore level and the junior level experimental design lab that we did in the spring. The students start first off with some pre-lab work. Um, and this for me was in the form of some short videos with some pop-up questions. And I'll show you how I did that in just a little bit. Um, it can also be simply having them read over the lab handouts. Um, I also had them complete some pre-lab activities. After doing that, the students then submitted muddiest points. So I asked them what is most unclear about the lecture and what's most interesting. And then what I did was I came up with a response. And you can deliver that response synchronously. You could post uh, responses or videos on discussion boards. Um, but you must frequently check out these muddiest points and you must respond to them. So then what the students did uh, when they came into the lab, first we went over the high level goals for that day. We then had a high level uh, muddiest point discussion trying just to summarize some of the things that I had posted on a discussion board. Um, and then they got into group work. So I had the students create their own, this is a four hour uh, lab period. I had them create their own Zoom rooms, work in their groups, and then they could come into the instructional team's um, virtual offices at any point. I also had some dedicated times for them to come. So they had a dedicated meeting with a TA and an instructor during every class period. Then we came back together at the end to reconnect and to look ahead to the next week. So now I want to talk a little bit more about how I created these mini lectures, uh, my online videos. So I used Panopto. It was integrated with Canvas, which we use at Northwestern. Um, and I created really short videos that were less than 15 minutes. The shorter you can make them, the better. I would suggest that you chunk them by topical area. This allows them to be modular and you can move them around. Include those learning objectives and the summary slides. That's really a built-in study guide for your students. And it's great when you're writing tests. You can go back and making, make sure that you're writing your test questions to align with those objectives. I have then embedded questions and these questions you can kind of see a little snapshot here of a question. They actually jump started the students. I would have them periodically through the lecture um, and the students actually would watch the, the lectures uh, if they had these questions in there. And so I had probably about 85% of my students and I had about 80 82 students watch these lectures consistently throughout the quarter. Um, I also would encourage you to include your video that really helps provide a connection with uh, the instructor. And even I had people in my course evaluations talk about my dogs who would periodically make um, appearances in the video. So it really, I think, uh, humanized me as an instructor and I would encourage you to include that in your courses as well. So in terms of engagement, so this is Panopto is great in that it will track things like number of views and um, unique, unique viewers for you. So you can see that I had a lot of views right around when these pop-up questions were due. And then you can see I had people revisit it as they were studying for the test. If you look within this particular video, you can see that I get a bump in viewers uh, right around these pop-up questions. Um, so this is a, a great way to encourage viewers. So that's all about the flip classroom. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about guided inquiry. So what is guided inquiry and how do I incorporate it in my labs? And it can also be incorporated in, um, in traditional other engineering classes, ones that you typically have a lecture in. But we'll really focus in on how I did it in the laboratory setting. So you can see on the left side of the screen that there are a lot of different types of inquiry. Limited inquiry where you have students that just follow a cookie cutter lab and they're trying to match their results with some established result maybe in their textbook. Um, it gets a little bit more open-ended and structure, structured inquiry when the students don't have a predetermined answer but really they have all the steps laid out. 
in guided inquiry, we give the students the ability to come up with how they're going to investigate the problem. And in open inquiry, they can even uh, come up with the question. So for our laboratory, we operated in between the guided inquiry and open inquiry levels. Um, and we also adopted the, the five E's of inquiry based learning. So students are engaging um, in the in the in the context, their knowledge is being activated, they start to explore what's happening, um, they're challenging some ideas, then they will do the experiment to gain some new knowledge and apply that to the to the particular scenario that they're working in. Um, they will elaborate it, transfer it perhaps to new situations and evaluate their learning. And this evaluation piece plays in really nicely with our standards based grading and our reflection. Um, our, our reflection processes that we'll talk about as we go through this lecture. So why did I implement uh, guided inquiry labs? First of all, it instills critical thinking. It really increases engagement of our students. And it's been really successful in, um, in biology and chemistry and physics courses. It is becoming more popular in engineering and it has a lot of parallels to engineering design. So it's really a natural thing to include in our laboratory classes uh, in biomedical engineering. So how did I structure my labs? So they were multi-week labs. Um, so at first the students would design their experiment. They would come up with their own hypothesis, how they're gonna test it. Then they would do um, their experiment, analyze their data, reflect, and then if time permits, they could redesign and try it again. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the details of what happens in BME 207, the sophomore level of this experimental design lab, and 307, the junior level. So first, the, the sophomore level. There are three activities that I'm going to introduce you to. The first is uh, the creation and characterization of a sensor to measure distance from a light source. And so students use some uh, apps they could download on their phones to do this. They also had the opportunity to create their own Fitbit, essentially, um, so they were able to measure activity levels, um, looking at step count and calories burned, and they had a fun competition with the uh, instructor, uh, Matt Tresh, who could make the best, most accurate um, sensor. And they had the opportunity to do a lot of community building within um, teams through this, these activities. In activity three, which I headed up, the students were using um, another app on their phone, a heart rate monitoring app, and that allowed them to collect data very easily without any equipment, uh, except for their smartphone, at home. They were able to generate a biomedically relevant hypothesis, design their experiment, and then use statistical models to interpret um, their findings. And so they were testing their own hypothesis, uh, hypotheses. They were creating their own videos um, for data collection. So these videos were viewed by other teams. Um, so everybody in the whole class was collecting data for multiple projects. So they could not only work within um, their own team, but across teams as well. And that was really great for community building in the course. My colleague uh, in the junior level course, he actually created these BME care packages, which he uh, sent to the students for his human physiology ex instrumentation labs. Um, so the students were able to actually develop and test real instrumentation. They could process their own data. They created their own hypotheses um, and, and came up with the experiments to test them. And so some examples of hypotheses that they came up with. Um, so for the sophomore level class, um, the one I taught, it was hypothesized that a person's heart rate will increase after a jump scare. Um, for the junior level hypotheses, uh, and this is an example here, we hypothesize that if blood pressure measurements are taken with a slower breathing rate, systolic, diastolic, blood pressure, and mean arter arterial pressure will be significantly lower compared to when blood pressure is taken with a faster breathing rate. So these are really um, biomedically relevant and fun hypotheses that these students were able to do in their own homes in teams. But we wanted to be able to assess them. How, 
how are how is the student uh, how is guided inquiry working um, for our students what's their attitude about it um, and how does it help them progress in terms of things like scientific literacy so we gave them a survey that had been assessed for uh, validity and reliability. The first part is about scientific literacy. So uh, students would rate certain statements on uh, their confidence, where one was not confident to four was very confident. Um, they would also so this was the scientific literacy survey was administered at the beginning of the term and then at the end of the term. We also looked at their attitude in terms of motivation theory. We looked at halfway through and at the end of the term um, and had them rate certain statements on a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree. And I'm gonna show you the results now. I'm gonna show you some results from ASU um, and then I'll show you some results from Northwestern. So here, I'm just gonna pick out some things to highlight, but the students had a positive attitude about this pedagogy. So they found, um, so here we have the, the uh, midway point of the term and the end of the term. They found that this guided inquiry lab was favorable in terms of their interest level. They found that it was useful to use guided inquiry. They didn't think it was too costly in terms of time and emotion, and they wanted to see it in other laboratories. So we ended up with 92% of the students wanting to see this in other uh, laboratory courses. Then I made the switch over to, uh, oh, I think I have one more slide before I get to the Northwestern data. In terms of scientific literacy, the ASU students saw improvements in the ability to assess experimental methodology. Um, again, this is looking at the beginning of the, the term to the end of the term. Um, they saw a large increase in terms of their ability to design and experiment and also challenge scientific authority. You could see um, that students really had, had a hard time with with doing that if they were looking at journal articles, um, really cl critically evaluating the statements that they were reading. When we look at what happened at Northwestern, we saw that our, the Northwestern students had the same um, top improvements. Our students at Northwestern also saw a big improvement in terms of designing an experiment. And here I have this now on the scale of, of um, one not confident to four really confident. Um, they also uh, showed a big improvement in terms of challenging uh, the authority. Our students also saw an increase in the ability to state a testable hypothesis. So we were seeing these improvements um, in scientific literacy, which were main objectives of the course. So now I want to talk a little bit about how we evaluated the students. And as I mentioned, we used a non-traditional assessment called standards-based grading. So in terms of standards-based grading, this is a student-centered approach, and it evaluates students' progress toward developing a particular skill set. So how you do this is you first create a standard. And so a standard is a lofty educational goal. And the learning objectives that uh, fee, uh, fall out from that standard are what you want your students to be able to do. So by the end of this lecture, your student should be able to do X, Y, and Z. And then when it comes to actually evaluating the stu students, when you're looking for evidence that they have learned these uh, objectives, that is going to be your, uh, through your rubric design. So why do we switch to standards-based grading? It allows for dynamic and targeted instruction. So I'm able to adapt um, my strategies in the classroom, uh, pivot based on what my students' needs are. It also allows students to direct their own learning and it provides self-efficacy, not only through the course, but after the course as well. So as I mentioned, um, standards-based grading, or you may have heard it called mastery-based grading, um, this is something that's fairly popular in K through 12 and uh, now is, is catching on in higher education. There was a multi-institutional uh, uh, study that looked at some benefits and barriers and best practices to standards-based grading. And this was headed up by Adam Carberry and others. 
And so while standards-based grading um, is an unfamiliar grading system for many uh, students, and there are lots of different ways to implement it, it really shifts the focus to learning. So it, it shifts away from looking for points to am I actually understanding and mastering uh, the course objectives. It allows a lot of opportunities for feedback about the students learning and, uh, the, and the instruction and it allows students uh, to, to assess themselves regularly. So we adapted this uh, adopted standards based grading and we used the best practices highlighted by the study. We tracked a few standards. We used a simple scale. We provided lots of feedback and we gave multiple attempts at showing mastery. And that's really a critical thing. Um, and if you were to implement standards based grading, they should have three or more opportunities to show whether or not that they've mastered these standards. So what standards did we use? Um, we loosely created standards uh, around problem solving and they aligned really nicely with what employers wanted to see in graduates. We found that from some uh, literature that had shown, uh, had interviewed a lot of uh, industry and, and really highlighted what they expect to see in our graduates. And it aligned really nicely with ABET as well. So we're looking at problem identification and knowledge processing, experimental design, analysis, interpretation, communication, and teamwork. So those fit in really nicely with our, our course, a laboratory course in particular. And we're able to track these uh, colorimetrically in Canvas. Um, there's a learning outcomes feature, and you can see here our standards across the top and the, the legend here uh, for what each of these colors mean. The, the red here would mean that the student is well below mastery and dark green would be exceeding mastery. So you can see where each student is and you can also see where your class is as a whole. And so you can target your instruction based on that. So we wanted to investigate um, standards-based grading and we did this in collaboration with our TA. Uh, she is in, uh, this is Lisa um, Beckman, and we had two quarters. We had one quarter where the students had the traditional grading rubric um, that they were presented with at the beginning and one where they had the standards-based grading rubric. And so we then took the reports for both terms and we assessed them. We assessed them against both rubrics. We wanted to see um, kind of what fell out from, from each of those rubrics. So what did we find? We found that students that got the standards-based grading rubric actually had more coherent and contextualized writing. Um, the content wasn't dictated by the rubric, so there was nice flow. Um, and the students really felt motivated um, to direct their own learning in this way. We did see that because we didn't give them line by line, you must include controls, you must include um, p-value, all that kind of thing, that sometimes they lack some in, uh, lack detail in the report. We did see this get better over the, the quarter, um, but that's something that, because the traditional rubric had everything in there that, you know, obviously the students were able to check it off and incorporate that. Some students um, were concerned that perhaps the movement to standards-based grading would mean that their grade would get worse, um, but we saw actually students scored higher when they were given the standards-based grading rubric. Um, but if you compare it between the two groups, they still had a couple of the same weaknesses. So we found that students struggled with problem identification and interpretation, and that's really informed our teaching. And so we hope to revisit um, th these weaknesses and hopefully see some improvement based on how we've changed how the course um, is structured. And in the future, we want to boost up the reflection. Um, we are going to, uh, with, at, by adding in reflection, you're able to increase awareness of, of, your, of the students developing skill set, um, obviously able to, te to tailor our teaching and our learning. And the hope is, is that is, is that if the students have a, more of, a, of an awareness of the skill set that they have, that they could leverage that in a job interview setting. They're going to be better uh, able to articulate their skills. So that brings us to the last, um, the last strategy that I want to talk about, and that's reflection. 
there are two reflective practices that I'm going to talk about. I've mentioned both of them briefly. The first one is the muddiest point exercise. And this is the one that is probably the easiest to incorporate um, in any class, the most bang for your buck, um, I would say. And the second thing we'll talk about will be the reflection after standards-based grading. And we'll talk a little bit about where our future work will go. So what is the muddiest point exercise? I've told you a little bit about it, but let me tell you in more detail. So in this exercise, I collect anonymous, that's how I did it, um, student input, or it could be confidential. And I asked them not only what is the most, uh, what is the muddiest point, but what's the most interesting point. I find that that acts as a nice counterpoint um, to the unclear points. And it's a form of frequent formative feedback. So in advance of every class, I am looking at what those, um, those quotes say, and I'm providing some kind of uh, response. And it clarifies the confusing course content before the students get to the test, or heaven forbid, after the test when they look up what the answer should be or ask about the answer. And some really uh, some strengths of the muddiest point is that it causes the students to self-reflect on their understanding regularly. It empowers the student. They're able to get help quickly, easily. Um, it also humanizes the instructor. It shows that we care for them and we acknowledge that things can be explained in different ways and perhaps the way that it was explained doesn't work for some people or maybe for the majority of the people and that's something we need to know and adapt to. So how do I do this? How do I collect and respond to the muddiest points? So I deliver the content. I do it either, um, you could do an in-person lecture. I do the recorded lectures for the flipped classroom. And this very shortly thereafter, the students should reflect. Um, I do this through a survey on Canvas. I make mine, as I said, anonymous. You can make it confidential where you know the student's identity, but don't uh, divulge that to the class. And then you come up with some kind of, uh, you. then you have to do the reflection as the instructor. So I look at all of the quotes. If you have a lot, you can actually put it into a word cloud generator. And the topic with the that comes up the most would be the biggest word. And that helps you kind of focus down if, uh, if you have 100 students. And that was especially important at ASU. If you just have a small class, then you can read through all of them very quickly. You don't have to respond to all of them in class. You can act, what you should actually do is pick those that are most popular uh, and central to the learning objectives and address those. And if you can, you can address the other ones maybe in a supplemental document that you upload onto your Blackboard or Canvas. Um, and then what we do is we modify our content delivery. So maybe make, create a short video or do an activity um, so that the students have an ability to work on it a little bit more with their peers. Um, so definitely want to do an alternate format. You don't want to just refer to the point in your lecture where um, you explained it the first time. So just quickly, just thinking about the difference between confidential or anonymous versus confidential feedback from the students. They're pluses and minuses with both. Um, as I said, I do the anonymous. And it gets rid of the students worrying what the instructor thinks of them. It, maybe they think that they should have known that answer and they feel kind of embarrassed to, to write that. This gets rid of that. They can write anything they want. But that also means that if they're pressed for time, maybe they won't spend a lot of time reflecting and they'll just put whatever they want. Um, I do see that sometimes, but there are, most students are very thoughtful in their feedback. In terms of the confidential, you kind of have the opposite. Um, students may have reluctance to show their any weakness. And a plus is that the instructor can really could reach out if there is a one off question to that student directly um, instead of avoiding class time on a, a small point for one student. So how does this work? I have used this in several different classes, and this is some data from uh, ASU. I taught biomaterials and statistics and transport, and I didn't see a difference in terms of attitude in any of the classes. So the students found it moderately interesting, but they found it overwhelmingly uh, useful and also not costly in terms of time and emotion. Um, so it was a really easy thing to get started in the classroom with. So now, um, the second thing, I wanna talk about reflection after standards-based grading. So to follow up on uh, some work that I, I 
became aware of at ASWE by um, Heidi Deef Stucks, she showed that standards-based grading is more effective if the students reflect on your feedback um, than if they don't. So a lot of times, it, like for example, in a traditional, with a traditional assessment, the student will look at the grade. If they're fine with the grade, they shove it in their backpack and they move on. That can happen a little bit with standards-based grading if students don't take the time to actually look at it, reflect on it, and come up with a plan for the next time. And so we implemented this in our laboratory co course. We asked the students, they met with, as a team, with, um, with the TA, and these were team reports, and we asked them to talk about these four questions. So what have they and have they not learned? How well do they think our evaluation of their work matches up with the first, um, the first question? We also wanted them to come up with a priority for the future. What are they going to work on? And what specific actions are they going to take based on our evaluation of their work? So this is something that we're going to do even more this time, this year. We're going to actually uh, amp up the formal reflection. And we're going to see, we're going to, as I mentioned at the beginning, implement these lab notebooks, so another type of reflection. And we're going to see how these reflective practices um, will affect mastery in the class. And we're hoping to see some improvements there. So I wanted to give kind of a holistic view of the course, uh, or both courses. Um, so the first being the sophomore level class that I taught. I had the privilege of having a great ratio of instructional team to students. And so that is that worked really, really well. Um, this quarter I have more students and, and, and less help. And so I'll be trying the, these strategies out. I'm, I'm still using um, the same setup. I think it will scale quite nicely. But I just wanted to, to mention that, that I did have a lot of instructional team uh, help. So peer mentors are critical, TAs are critical, and if you have a co-instructor, that's helpful too. Um, so the course structure that I highlighted through this talk, um, the students thought it was favorable for this type of lab course. They thought that the pre-lab activities were balanced. They liked the ability to learn some of the concepts outside of class. Um, so they felt prepared for when they came to the class meetings. Um, they liked coming together as a class uh, at the beginning to recap some important concepts and kind of get a to-do list for the day. And uh, we did some icebreakers and team charters and some of those things to build um, healthy team dynamics before we jumped into the quarter and students really appreciated that. Students also thought that the course prepared them for research. 85% of the students thought that the course helped them with their future research, research or made them more confident to perform research. And that was a main objective of the course. And then lastly, I think this quote sums it up. I think given the circumstances of remote learning, the experiments we did were very applicable in our own homes and most importantly doable. And going forward, I think they could be intro experiments for students on campus to do before they begin more advanced experiments with complicated devices. So students actually saw a place for this even when we go back to in-person laboratory courses. And this data is from my uh, colleague, Professor O'Neill. He saw similarly that students felt the learning happened in the labs, the hands-on experience. Um, they really liked to have the interactive learning activities, and it, it gave them motivation for learning. And I've brought it up a couple times, but he incorporated these lab notebooks, which were graded um, base, basically for faithful rep record keeping so they could be wrong they could have show some of their failures and and document that and get credit and that really helped motivate as we see here motivated the students to learn and it really decreased their stress levels um, as compared to having a traditional lab report which is something i wanted to explore uh, going forward so that kind of brings us to the end here i incorporated a lot of evidence-based strategies that i had been using in my in in-person classes, the flipped classroom, guided inquiry, standards-based grading and reflection. And I incorporated in this virtual lab setting, which has been used in another laboratory course as well. But the important take-home message here is that it can be used in any course. Um, and I think that you'll find, uh, find them to be easy to implement and, uh, and really helpful for your students. So 
with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. So Casey, for the open, the open inquiry, if you, if you motivate that in your class, how do you make sure that this, the class and the students don't get too far off track? Yes, okay, so um, I, I'm gonna talk about it from my perspective of ASU. I had a 100 person lab section one section and I had to make the, I had limited number of resources and I needed them to be able to have as much flexibility and coming up with their own hypothesis as possible. So um, what we did is we provide the students a list of what we have, the reagents that they have. Um, and they have to work within the confines of our materials and they had to have all their hypotheses approved. So you could do it a couple ways. Um, some labs, I, if there was enough flexibility, I allowed each team to have their own hypothesis. Sometimes, I maybe because of endpoints and things like that, I made them reach a consensus and we did one hypothesis. So they actually had to come up and present their different hypotheses and kind of pitch it. And then we did a voting process and then we picked the best one. And so I... And if I didn't have something that was in there and I thought I could get it on Amazon really fast, then I ordered it. So I tried to give as much flexibility, but yes, you definitely have constraints in terms of time and money. Um, and of course, you always want it to be applicable to BME, so you always have to rein them in sometimes. And I should say, if any of you want to try any of these things, um, you know, Muddiest Points, like I said, is a really easy thing to get started in. And you have questions about how to implement it in your own course, you should reach out to me. I'm ha happy to help you get started. Um, it really has transformed how I've taught. Um, and I, I really think you won't regret trying them out. Mm -hmm.